We are going to move on to our last presentation of the day. Um, it is evaluating the use of soil applied microbial products to control overwintering olive fruit fly. Um, Joanna Fisher is a PhD environmental scientist uh, at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And today she will be presenting. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so the work I'll be presenting today is work I did um, as a postdoc at University of California in Davis. So the olive fruit fly is a pretty nasty pest of olives. It was first detected in California in 1998. Since then, it has spread throughout the state. And it's really considered the most important pest of olives. Um, if you have olives, you are probably familiar with it. Um, so they cause damage by inserting eggs underneath the skin of the fruit. You can see there's a little female fly who's doing that with this olive now. And then as the larvae develop and feed within the fruit, it destroys the fruit and can also introduce in bacteria and fungi, which can cause rot. Um, so because of this, there's a very low tolerance for this pest in especially olives that will be processed for table olives, but there's also a low tolerance in olive oil. And um, if they're, whatever the olives will be processed into, they have to be processed very quickly if there is olive fruit fly damage to prevent rotten from occurring. Um, so management currently relies on a spinosad bait, GF120. However, we know that there's widespread resistance to this uh, product. And um, we have growers who are saying that they've lost um, control or it's not working as well as it used to. Uh, there's also Danitol that can be applied, but it's a broad spectrum pesticide and can cause secondary pest outbreak. Um, the growers I talk to really view it as a pesticide that they use as a last resort. Um, it can also only be used a couple times of the year, so it's, it's difficult to really obtain good control um, with that product as well. This is an overview of the olive fruit fly life cycle. Uh, so if we start here in the spring and summer, we have uh, flies which are flying around the orchard. They're laying eggs inside of olives, and we get about three to four generations a year in California. So during the summer, the whole life cycle is completed within the olive except for, of course, the adults. So the eggs are laid in the olive, the larvae develop, the pupae develop in the olive, and then we get adults emerging, um, which will then mate and lay eggs again in olives. Now in the fall, um, quite a few of the pupae drop off into the soil. Uh, we do know that there's some adults that will remain active over the course of the winter in California, especially if the temperatures are mild, um, but the majority of people are going to drop off and overwinter in the soil. And then in the spring, they'll merge from the soil to start their life cycle all over again. So rather than trying to target uh, control when the insects are fairly difficult to access um, during the summer and spring, we wanted to see if we could maybe stop this life cycle where it really begins and control them while they're in the soil. So to do this, we looked into using commercially available products that are available for growers in uh, California um, that use insect pathogenic fungi. Um, the advantage of using insect pathogenic fungi is that these soil naturally occur, I mean, these fungi naturally occur in soil and they can persist uh, for weeks and sometimes months in a soil environment. They can also kill their hosts uh, just through contact. So the spores of the fungus, which are alive um, in these products, they will land on the insect, they'll germinate, grow inside of the insect, and then kill the insect. So they don't need to be ingested, but they just need to come in contact with the insect. So we evaluated um, these three different products to see if they could effectively control the olive fruit fly. And we wanted to look at whether or not we should target the sprays to either be in the fall um, and the autumn when the pupae are dropping off into the soil um, to kill them at this stage, or if they should be applied in the spring before the adults emerge out of the soil environment. So today I'll be talking about 
three different aspects of our studies. We had a lab component where we went into the lab and we assessed how effective these products were against the flies in the lab environment. We also did a field study where we looked at whether or not the fungi would persist in, in a orchard. Um, and we also had a field study that we conducted to see if we could obtain control of the olive fruit fly under field conditions. And this was um, a two-year project. Um, so for our lab study, we wanted to try mimic what would happen if the pupae dropped off into, or the larvae dropped off into soil and then pupated in the soil. So we placed both pupae or larvae into soil that had been treated with one of our three products, MET-52, Biocerus, or Micotrol, or water. And they were placed in the soil, and then we let them just stay in the soil until they became emerged out of the soil as adults. And we just counted how many adults successfully emerged from the soil that had been inoculated with one of our three products. So unfortunately, what we found is that the pupae and larvae are not uh, very susceptible to any of the three products we tested. And we were getting mortality rates around nine to 12%. Um, mind control was a little more effective. It killed about 19% of larvae and pupae. Um, this could be because the larvae very quickly become pupae once they reach the soil within hours, they'll pupate. Um, and then the pupae are fairly resistant likely to naturally occurring fungi in the soil since they're adapted to be able to live in the soil for months during the winter as they overwinter. So instead we looked at, okay, well, could we maybe control the adults as they are emerging out of the soil? And after our first year, uh, we had a, some lab results that looked promising, so we looked into this. So we conducted a very similar uh, lab study where we placed pupae into soil that had been inoculated with fungus, but this time, instead of just seeing, okay, would they successfully become adults, we held the adults um, to see if they would die after some time. And we used two different rates of my control. We either used a, uh, 1.5 quarts per acre or a rate that was equivalent to two quarts per acre. So this is a figure showing uh, a model of the data and here we have percent mortality on our y-axis and this is days after the experiment started. So the experiments are when those pupae were put into the soil. This is where the adults are emerging out of the soil. And then this is 45 days after the start or about 28 to 29 days after the flies emerge over here. So what we found is we were getting around 27 to 33% mortality with our two fungal treatments after 28 to 29 days after emergence um, compared to, so it was higher than our controls. Um, there wasn't a big gain that we got with increasing our uh, rate of our product. Uh, they, it wasn't significantly higher mortality here. So we're getting moderate mortality after 30 days. Um, now, all of fruit flies do begin to lay eggs after about eight days, the females um, can start laying eggs. So it is possible that some of these flies that did eventually die may not have died before they were, they had the potential of laying eggs. Um, so we wanted to know, okay, under field conditions, would the fungi be able to persist in the soil long enough to really, is, since all of the flies don't necessarily emerge out of the soil um, all at one time, uh, could it persist in the soil for a while? So we apply the fungus to the ground in our orchards, and then we would take uh, regular soil samples. We'd bring those soil samples back to the lab. We put them on this nutritive uh, media that provided all the nutrients the fungi needed to grow. And it also contained antibiotics to prevent the growth of um, just uh, other bacteria and fungi that we weren't interested in. And we looked to see if we had any of uh, the active ingredient, Bouveria, um, growing. And so the little white colonies that you see are actually Bouveria bassiana, our active ingredient growing on one of the plates um, that we plated with soil from the field. So I haven't finished analyzing the data from this year. Um, from a previous year's data, we know that if you apply the fungus in the fall, uh, we're seeing persistence around up to about two months. 
Um, this year, we applied the fungi in mid to late March in our uh, field sites. And we know that there was blueberry present in the soil until the last sampling dates on the 21st of May and the 10th of June um, in our two different sites. So um, I can't show you how much was persisting at that point, but we did have persistence throughout the adult emergence period. So that was a very good thing. Next, I'll go ahead and go to our field study that we conducted this year. Um, so we had two different field sites. They're both located in Sonoma County. One was in Hillsburg and the other one was in Hawthorne. Uh, so both of these sites contained uh, multiple varieties of olives. Uh, they were located in kind of different terrain. The Hillsburg site, uh, this is a hill here, and then it goes down to a bit more flatland. This site in Hoplin was on a uh, ridge, so it had actually quite a steep slope. At each site, we had four control plots um, and four treated plots. In Hoplin, the treated plots are the yellow and orange um, colored plots. So we set up these plots, and then each of these plots were sprayed with my control and spring. Uh, before we began spraying them for fungus, we've set out these yellow McPhail traps, which were baited with truly yeast, and we monitored the olive fruit fly populations in the field so that we would know when um, emergence started. And then as soon as we saw, we started seeing flies in the field, then we uh, had the application applied, uh, spray my control as soon as possible. So at each of our sites, the plots were sprayed with a ground application of 1.5 quarts of my control per acre in 50 gallons of water. Uh, this is one of the spray rigs that was used, so you can see kind of the overall setup. Uh, we did have a different kind of method of application at each of our sites. So at our Hopland site, we were able to get the spray applied across pretty much all of the orchard soil, including the aisle between our trees. At the um, Hillsburg site, the trees were only sprayed underneath the tree canopy, but not in the aisle of the plots. And, and that will be important when I go over my results, um, which are coming up. So to measure how many flies were actually present in our field sites, we placed these, again, these uh, McPhail traps that had the truly used tablets. We had four traps placed at the center of each of our plots, and then they were checked weekly starting in, um, in February until July. And this was work that was done by Cindy and her assistant, Juan Paulo. So what did we actually see with those trap numbers? So this figure here shows the number of flies that were found in the trap. Um, this is again a, a model of the data, um, so kind of not the actual data itself, just a model of it. And then this is the date when our Healdsburg site was sprayed and then when our Hopland site was sprayed. So our Hopland site was up on that ridge. It was a cooler site and we saw uh, all of fruit fly emergence begin later. So that's why we have this delay in spray between our two sites. So at both sites, and this, these figures include, these lines include both the control and the treated plot. So this is just overall fly numbers at our field sites. So at our Healdsburg site, we see a little increase in fly numbers over time. There's some, but it's not very drastic. At our Hoplin site, we see a greater increase in fly numbers in general. However, overall at both sites, we had very few flies um, in all of our plots over the course of this year. It was just um, a fairly low olive fruit fly uh, season overall. Now the real question, do we see a decrease in olive fruit flies in our treated plots compared to our control plots? So the blue lines show our treated plots, the red lines show the control plots, and then we've got the total flies per trap over here. So overall, we had fairly low trap numbers. Um, at our Healdsburg site, we did not see a decrease in um, all the fruit flies caught in traps due to treatment. In fact, in our treated plots, we actually saw a little bit higher number. However, we have a lot of, the data is very noisy. It has a lot of uh, variability. Um, 
but unfortunately we did not see a decrease. And this is also our site where we had less of the fungus applied. It was not, uh, or less mycotrol applied and the mycotrol was not applied in the aisles of the plots. At our Hopland site where we had better spray coverage, uh, we do see lower numbers of flies in our treated plots compared to our control plots. However, it wasn't a significant difference. So, you know, this effect is not significantly uh, different, which is unfortunate. Now, our next question was, okay, well, if one thing can look at the number of flies in the field, what actually happens when it comes to damage that these flies are causing on the fruit? So uh, 300 olives were collected per plot, about 100 to 200 per tree from the center of each of these plots in September. We had to wait later than we typically would have waited to collect the fruit because there was such low damage at both of our field sites. Um, and just it, there just weren't a lot of flies this year. So what we found is this is our Hillsburg site, again, that site where we had um, not a ton, uh, where we, we were missing that spray coverage in our the middle of our tree aisles or orchard aisles. And we did not see any difference in all of the damage between our control versus our treated plots. Overall, you can see damage was quite low this year. At the Hopland site, we did see a significant decrease in damage in our treated sites. Um, it was 9%, so not a huge amount, but some, some decrease in damage. And again, that was the site where we had good spray coverage. So overall, kind of what can we take away from the study? Um, out of the three products we tested, Microtrol is the most effective against um, all of fruit fly. And we did find that overall, Microtrol is more effective against burning adults. The larvae and the pupae are fairly resistant. So um, if this product is going to be used for all of fruit fly control or further research is going to be done on it, spring application could be, should be considered um, in comparison to a fall application. I will also note that one of the fungal products, which I started out testing the um, MET52 is actually no longer available. Uh, they stopped manufacturing it last year, so that's no longer available to growers, just in case you were interested about that product. Uh, Microtrol and Bioceros are commercially available. We did find that Microtrol had good persistence in orchard soil. Um, from our first year field study, we know it persists for two months. This year, I don't know the amount of persistence, but again, it did persist through adult emergence. Uh, however, as far as controlling and reducing fly numbers in the field, so we didn't see a big treatment effect. Um, as far as fly numbers in the field, it was mixed at our site with um, good spray coverage, we saw a slight reduction, but again, it was not statistically significant. Um, and at our other site, we did not see a reduction in fly numbers caught in the field. We did have low fly numbers overall, so maybe that was a factor, but um, you know, we still did not see a, see a really significant reduction. At our Hopland site, we did see some reduction in damage, um, but we did not see that at our Healdsburg site. So overall, more research needs to be done to look into effective control measures for all of root fly. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody involved in the study. There was a lot of people who were involved. I would especially like to thank um, Cindy Cron and Juan Paulo Solari, who was her assistant. They did the majority of the field work this year and, were, and Cindy is just a fantastic collaborator. So I just like to thank her for all of her work. Um, I like to thank the growers who not only let us do the study on their property, but also they were very supportive and they did the spray applications themselves and provided the labor for that. Um, and I would like to thank the members of the Salem lab who, when I went to go take my job at CDFA, I left uh, partway through the field season. And if it weren't for them and for Cindy, um, the study would not have been completed. So I would like to just thank everyone who was involved, um, as well as Emily Sims, who is a collaborator for the first year. Um, and also Danny Lytle and my funding sources. So thank you very much. And I would be happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Joanna. Um, let's see. 
Michelle will be logging on to there yeah, to do the questions. Yeah, uh, there are two questions for you so far. Um, the first one, do B Bastiana and Meta Rhizium products have an OMRI endorsement? Um, ooh, I'm trying, so, okay. The, it depends on the product. Um, so definitely check their labels. Mitral is certified organic and I'm trying to remember what organic certification it has. Um, let me just go up to <laughs> my picture. Um, so anyway, check the labels. Not all are certified organic and yeah, I don't remember. It is certified organic, but yeah, I can't remember what organic certification it has. So yeah, definitely double check that. The um, the, the Metarizium the Metarizium product I mentioned, it's it's no longer commercially available, unfortunately. So um, yeah, that's unfortunate, and it was not certified organic. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is how many years of using uh, GF120 um, until resistance was developed? Oh, that is a great question. Um, Trying to remember when it was first approved. So it was used starting in. I don't remember, it was quite a while. It, it took quite a while for resistance to de develop. Um, yeah, and whoever had that question, um, I can, I will I will look it up. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'll look it up and get back to you. So uh, just uh, look at my email, I can put it in the chat and you can just shoot me that email and I'll, I'll let you know today, I just have to look up. Great, Th this question actually comes from the chat. Um, it says, do you think the drought contributed too low numbers of olive fruit fruit flies. Sorry. Um, in this case, I mean that's a very good question because we were tracking relatively heavily in each of our plots. I don't think overall it was contributing though to significantly reducing all fruit fly population. And part of that is because our plots were fairly uh, you know, they were surrounded by other olives. So um, other olives could have come, all, other olive fruit flies could have come into our plots. And we've seen higher numbers in traps. It, so I guess in higher number, in, in years when there's more flies, and we've also had a similar number of traps out, it didn't seem like we were like trapping out the population, if that makes sense. So I don't know for sure, but I don't think Okay. Um, and then the, the last question that I'm seeing, why don't you try testing the materials and the bait traps? Yeah, that's actually something that um, we started thinking about when we found the adults were more susceptible compared to the larvae and pupae. Um, so... I don't know, I'm a, uh, so, I, well, you know, short answer is, you know, for this particular grant and, you know, now I'm working for CETA that, you know, I, I don't have the time or ability, unfortunately. Um, longer answer is, it could be an avenue to test. Um, it will be, a trap will need to be designed though, that will allow the insects to both enter and then leave. And that would be kind of difficult. So, so if I were to try to target the adults with one of these products, I would probably actually go for a bait spray similar to GF120, but use a bait and then couple it with incorporating the fungus or another active ingredient, if there's another good active ingredient that's found to be effective, and then apply that as a foliar spray that the adults would feed on. So, so essentially just the bait spray by a different actor ingredient. Um, just for ease of use, and I think for being able to really be effective. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joanna.